Today I'm really excited because I finally get to talk about science and technology. That's what my passion lies in. I've spent all my professional life doing agricultural research or leading it. And I'm convinced that it's one of the most important agricultural improvement uh, measures that we have at our disposal. The success of agricultural R&D has been spectacular because we have analyzed rates of return that economists usually calculate of about 20 to 80 percent for investments in agricultural R&D. And that's very high. So if you had a bank account that would generate those kind of returns, you would obviously be very happy. Other evidence that we have shows very clearly that countries that have invested heavily in agricultural R&D also have had the strongest agricultural productivity and efficiency growth. So that is very clear. The current situation is that on a global scale, about 70 billion US dollars each year are being invested in agricultural research extension and other related development efforts. That's about 5% of the global spending on R&D on any kind. And there are two major players in that. So public sector funding, which accounts for about 55%, focuses, of course, very much on more fundamental and applied research, including human resources development to students and scientists. And it creates lots of public goods and knowledge that are widely available. And private companies invest about 45% of that total global and their focus is of course much more on things that provide more immediate market opportunities crop genetics or new seeds farm machinery agrochemicals food processing and so on we've had three major trends in the last two decades so the first one is that private sector funding has increased so it used to be less than five billion dollars in 1970 is now more than 30 billion dollars the second one is that middle income countries uh, now spend more than high-income countries on public R&D in the agricultural sector. That would include countries such as China, Brazil, or India, for example. And the third one, which is a more disturbing trend, is that low-income countries only account for 3% of the global agricultural R&D spending, and so the gap between those and high-income countries in terms of spending is actually widening. And that is not good. It will make these countries fall behind further. So the question then is uh, how much uh, uh, should countries uh, invest in agricultural R&D? I think the first uh, uh, statement I would say is that low and middle income countries who still have a very large dependence on the agricultural sector should spend at least 10% of their national budget on agriculture as a whole. And international donors, therefore, should also consider to have about 10% of their aid and other related mechanisms uh, invested in agriculture. In terms of research, it is, uh, I think, an aim that we should have to double funding for public agricultural R&D in the next 10 years, because that would foster much broader, much more open innovation and access to new things and would accelerate substantially the progress that can be made. In terms of relative rates of funding, a good measure is usually that countries should spend at least 1% of their agricultural GDP on R&D in the country. The present situation is that in the OECD countries, so that is about 2.8%, whereas in the low-income countries, the average is only 0.4%, which is, of course, well underfunded. So we have a problem of the imbalance of that kind. Now, we will probably see a number of significant revolutions in science and technology that affect the agriculture and food sector in the next 20 to 30 years. Genomics and synthetic biology. We expect massive changes there because the amount of information has increased exponentially and new techniques are becoming available to then also use this scientific information to much more precisely create new traits in crops or improve other aspects of the agricultural system, including many of the microbial processes involved in the soil or in the plant, or even the processing of food. So gene editing techniques, for example, are seen as one of the new revolutionary means of modification that will allow us to make much more precise changes that will produce much better performing plants. Digital agriculture, the use of information communication technology, remote sensing, mobile phones, sensors, Internet of Things, robotics, big data applications is 
already making its forays into just about every aspect of agricultural production, from the soil all the way to the consumer, and connecting many bits and pieces that haven't been able to connect with each other in the past. And lastly, bioeconomy, the creation of novel products uh, from biomass, uh, is seen as a substantial new form of adding value to the production of agricultural systems. So we can, for example, imagine that uh, instead of uh, producing just biomass for the usual food or feed or fiber purposes, we may have now the means to extract out of this biomass new substances. We can still use it for the original purpose, but after we have maybe removed a few things of high value, or we can use byproducts that we would normally throw away to make whole new products. So if we were able to have a more closed economy of this kind, or a green economy that is actually recycling these things or using them in a different way, we not just add more value, but we also actually reduce the overall carbon footprint of the agricultural systems. So let's just look at an example uh, of the bioeconomy kind. So more recently, a company in collaboration with research organizations who provided expertise in molecular biology, plant sciences, and another company who were experts in breeding, created the world's first commercial tire made from dandelion rubber. So dandelions have a rubbery substance in their stems, which you can see when you cut them, oozing out as a white rubber, and that can be used to make a tire. Of course, you would have to have commercial dandelion fields to produce that, but it's an example of what can be done now with modern science and technology. More broadly speaking, experts believe that in the car industry, uh, 30 to 50 percent of the interior or exterior parts of a car could in the future be made from bioplastics or other types of uh, biomass-based uh, products, which would of course uh, be also be very good for the climate and the environment. Well, besides those types of product-oriented innovations, uh, there is a strong need to also invest in new frontiers research. Things that, if they would succeed, could make a massive difference. They're difficult, and nobody can do it alone, and they may fail, but we've had examples of that in the past. One particular uh, invention that uh, a large team of scientists is working on right now on a global scale is the question of can we re-engineer the photosynthesis mechanism in crops to make it more efficient? So there are two types of crops in the world. Uh, C4 plants that have a more efficient photosynthesis mechanism, for example, maize, sorghum, sugarcane, and C3 plants like rice, wheat, or soybean, who for the same amount of sunshine and water and nutrients uh, produce less biomass than C4 plants. So the hypothesis is that if we understand the biological mechanisms and genetic controls of what is happening in a C4 plant and can transfer these things into a C3 plant, we should be able to produce C3 crops, which could have 30 to 50 percent higher yield and similar increases in the efficiency of water and nitrogen use. That would be a massive change. It's difficult. We don't know whether it will succeed. Probably we'll only know in about 20 years from now, but it is very important that investments are being made in these kind of things. One of the biggest challenges that we face in agricultural R&D is that it takes a long time to have an impact. So there is a cycle of our research, the development of a new technology, which is often 10 to 15 years. That's what it takes from the beginning of a research to, for example, breeding a new variety and making it ready for release. And there's another cycle of another 10 to 15 years until it often reaches peak adoption by large numbers of farmers. So you're talking about 20 to 30 years until a bigger impact can be reached. And that's probably not going to be good enough anymore in the future. So we need to think of new ways of accelerating this process, both components of it, either in the research side or in the diffusion and making things faster available to farmers. So in that context, uh, we believe that uh, more innovation culture is needed in the way we do science. So that requires changing the incentives for scientists uh, to think in a more entrepreneurial manner, but also work faster. And if that requires collaboration with others or also industry partners, uh, 
then that would be the key mechanism to pursue. So we need to think not just about a good idea, but right away also, okay, how could that idea be translated into a useful outcome, a useful product that somebody can do something with? So science should become more demand-driven, more outcome-oriented, and it should be implemented through faster R&D pipelines uh, or lean science approaches that enable us to start fast, but sometimes also test faster, and when necessary, stop fast, instead of carrying on forever in the wrong direction. So we need to take more risk. We need to be willing to work across different disciplines. We need to be willing to expose ourselves more to the end user faster. Yeah. And most importantly, we need to also be willing to share our thinking and our intellectual properties. And that leads me to my last point, which is uh, intellectual property systems will have to change. If they are managed well, they will advance innovation and impact, but they can also stifle it. The problem that we will face is that with the advances in scientific methodologies, it will increasingly become difficult to actually figure out who owns what. And we can spend all our time in the courts or paying lawyers instead of focusing on what we should be doing, which is innovation. So what I will argue for is that, by and large, we should move to a more open innovation concept and culture, the co-creation of intellectual property by many different partners who then also can bring to the table different types of knowledge. Countries uh, should incentivize this type of R&D through their public funding mechanisms and appropriate policies. In summary, I think foresight is needed to avoid running into another food crisis 20 or 30 years from now that will require large, stable investments in agricultural R&D. Uh, but hopefully, we can do things differently, faster, more open, more entrepreneurial, and less bureaucratic.